2017, and we are conducting an interview on my family history. Hi, my name is Araxi Bedrosian. My maiden name is Araxi Der Boosian. My father's name is Goryun Der Boosian, and my mother is Lose Der Boosian, and her maiden name is. Lose Amirian. My father is the only survivor of the Armenian Genocide, 1915. He was born in Erzurum, one of the cities of the Turkish Empire. At the same city, my grandmother was born and her name is Lucine Prudian. She is my mother's mom. She is the only survivor of her family during the genocide. My dad had five uncles. All of them were killed during the genocide. My dad is the only survivor of his family. And my grandmother, Lucine, she is the only survivor of the genocide. I walk, they walk the des deserts, and they end up in Mosul, Iraq, where I was born. My dad got married with my mom, Lose, in 19. 36. She was only maybe she was 17 years old. The first geno uh, the first generation after the genocide. But we were the second no, we were the first geno uh, survivor of the genocide my father's side. The, the first generation in Iraq yes. after the genocide. Yes, the first one. Yeah. Now I have to tell you a little bit about my dad in Mosul. As I said, I think I told you he was only nine years old during the genocide. And he says only, he was maybe mm, nine years old or seven years old. Nine years old in 1915. Yeah, 1915 he was only nine years old. All the people that they survived in Mosul, they have to stay in a hospital. Everybody was kind of sick. They should stay in a hospital for a while for treatment. Thank God my dad was not that sick. He could work in the hospital because he knew the alphabet and he knew the numbers like one, two, three, four, five. He was working there in the hospital serving or giving medications to the patients of the hospital because they used to put numbers and alphabet on the order that's how he could earn piece of bread end of the day that he can take that bread to home to his mother and his sister that they survived uh, question uh, how old was he when he was working in the hospital and what language did they speak there? He was nine years old, as I know. Maybe by then he was ten. And they spoke uh, Arabic, but my dad didn't know how to speak Arabic, but he tried his best to... because of the alphabet and numbers, it's the same. So that's why he could work. So he knew, but he didn't speak Arabic. He learned later because everything was stranger to these people. We are Armenians, as you know. We speak, we have our language, we have our culture, but in Mosul, Iraq, it was Muslim country and Arabic country. And there was, uh, they didn't know the language. But they survived. They worked very hard when they're certain age, 
they took care of their families. Um, now I have to tell you a little bit about my grandmother, Lucine, the only survivor of her family. The, the last person was saved in the desert was his brother. Whose brother? Lucine's brother, and my grandma's was brother. Was Erzurum. No, not Erzurum. Now in the desert, they're walking already. Okay. The only survivor that they had is Lucine's mother in the desert, not in Mosul, and the brother that he was hiding in the with the in blankets. They had horses and carriages to carry their stuff. This uncle was hiding in the blankets. But one day, one of the soldiers, Turk soldiers, they saw this guy. He said, you're not allowed to live. So next day, first thing in the morning, they killed him. That's why my grandma, Lucine, she was sad all her life, and she never recovered this genocide until the last day of her life. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about my grandmother, father's side. Real grandma, she passed away before the genocide. Your birth grandmother. My father's real mother, Goryun's mother. She, she, I don't know what was her problem. She got sick and she passed away. But my great, my grandpa, my dad's dad, married again to Holos. Nene. We call her Holos Nene. She was the grandma that saved my dad and my Horkur. Horkur is my father's sister. During the genocide or during the desert, the walking in the deserts, my dad had another sister. She was young, maybe two, three, three, four years old. When they reached Mosul, they lost her. I don't remember her name, but they lost her and they don't know if she was kidnapped or killed or died because she was not feeling well. This is how my dad told us all the stories that he could tell us. And he grew up in Mosul doing all kinds of jobs. And he liked cars. He liked to drive. So he was, he had a big truck for transportation. He used to do that business when he got married with my mom. This is in Mosul, right? In Mosul. So during the war, war two, he was working with British army. So they saw him, he's smart and he's, he knows uh, Arabic language and he speaks other languages. He spoke Arabic, English, Turkish, and uh, Armenian, of course. So they, after the war is over, they helped him and he established his business. Is this in the 1940s? After, war, 19, after, after war, world, world War II. Okay. So he had a transportation business uh, for the petrol company. He organized that because they had to transfer transfer employees or workers from one city to another. He took over that and they helped him a lot to do other businesses. He had a big store. He used to supply all the electronic uh, items like television, the washer and dryer and uh, and uh, stoves and lightings and all that. He used to have big store. He trans. He is the only agent. He used to get all this equipment from uh, London and from Germany. On the top of that, in Mosul, he had a big factory. Uh, it's a it's a drink that we call arak. It it looks like uh, ouzo, the Greek uh, drink. Is it alcoholic? Alcoholic. Yeah. Yes and he had that factory and we lived very comfortably we had a big house in Mosul everything was beautiful and we graduated all of us 
let me tell you about my family now. We were very happy and we all were born in Mosul, Iraq. Seven of us from real mom and dad and one we adopted a sister, her name is Arik Naz, that she came from uh, Ismail, our uh, villages north of Iraq. Uh, how did your father find uh, Arik? Oh, that's another story. Okay. How we, we're going to go back to that later. Or do you want me to tell you now? I can tell you, but I rather her telling us the okay. stories. Okay, well, yeah. we'll continue with because, that. Yeah, yeah. Now, in my family, the oldest sister is Kohari, their Bogosian. When was she born? I don't want to say the de death of births. No. Okay. Right. Yes, she was the firstborn. Okay. And then the second daughter was Anahid, their Bogosian. Then I had a brother, his name is Serop. Serop der Bogosian, he was my grandfather's name, Serop. And then I was born, I was the lucky one. And the star was <laughs> the born. The star, was, the star born. was born. And I was uh, born prematurely, seven months. Poor mom, she suffered a lot, but I survived. And then I had uh, my sister Mary Zavart. That she is coming for the wedding. She is in the airport right now, <laughs> LA airport. And then after that, we have two brothers, Ohannes or Barwir, and Rafi. Ohannes is the is the second brother in my family. Barwir is my father's uncle's name, so he had two names. So. Now let me tell you about our life in Mosul. We had uh, we uh, all this. Uh, I think I have a feeling it was only forty or fifty families survived the genocide, and all of them, most of them, from Erzurum. These are Armenian families. Armenian families, yes. They are the only ones survived. So we got together. I'm talking about my dad and his friends. And we opened, and they opened Armenian school. So there was Armenian school, and there we had a church, and we were very happy, all of us, like from my sister Koharik until my brother Rafi, we went to that school. Was the school a primary school? For the uh, elementary school. Elementary school, right. Armenian, everything we learned English, Armenian, uh, Arabic, and uh, religion classes. What was the name of this school? Armenian school. There is no other name, it's all right. And then, after that, during, okay, let me tell you what happened now, after we all born in Mosul and this and that. What year was yeah, this that was, with the school? Yeah. What, what year was the school established? Can you, can you remember? That I don't know. But I know my sister, older sister, born 1937, the school was that age, oh, yeah, okay. that age. She so is... she started the school from uh, elementary until uh, sixth grade. Okay. So I have a feeling it's thirty six, maybe thirty six or thirty seven. That's the year they opened the school. Now, let me tell you when we start having problems with the being a Christian and Armenian in Mosul. Nineteen fifty eight, they killed uh, King Faisal. Who, who killed? Uh, other party. They say they call themselves uh, Islamic party. Okay, so there was a king of Iraq at this time. Yes, there was a King Faisal and there, it was very nice. We had an athletic club, we had a special club that all the families, they used to celebrate Christmas and we had uh, parties all the time. I was too young to attend that parties but my older two sisters and my brother, they used to have a New Year's party, all kind of Thanksgiving parties and all that. It was a very nice uh, place to be. But 1958, after they assassinate the King Faisal, everything started going bad and we were not safe in Mosul. So the Iraq went into a revolution. Exactly. 
it was a kind of a communist and Muslim. I cannot say anything because they were kind of, they thought they were communist, but they have no idea what communist is. But after that, it was a, a Muslim revolution. So my dad felt like we are not safe in Mosul. We have to go to Baghdad. It's the capital of Iraq. It was a big city. Nobody knew my dad, nobody knew where we are. So we had to leave Mosul in 1959. We went to Baghdad, ran away kind of. We, we ran away at night <laughs> with our pajamas in the car. We had, <laughs> we had, I had two grandmas in Baghdad. So it's a big family. So we split the family. Some we stayed with the Lucine grandma, the other stayed with Holos mama grandma. So my dad and my mom went back again to Mosul. It's a big house. We have a lot of stuff. We had to get our furniture and everything to back that to start a new life. So that's what we did. I never seen Mosul again and I don't want to see it again. <laughs> so we grew up, I grew up in Baghdad. I was a teenager then. I had a very nice friends. I had a, uh, there was a, we had a athletic club, home in at men, hi Marnagan, uh, Marzagan club. Very nice athletic club. And there was another club that uh, we call it uh, youth Armenian club. I was a star there, of course. I was singing, I was dancing, I was involved with the theater, and I had a beautiful four years. So, 19... When was it? So Let me tell you. So, you no, went to Baghdad. We went to Baghdad, we grew up there. We kind of uh, grew up there, in the club and all that. During that time, my sister, older sister, she wanted to come to America very bad. She was uh, attending a girls' college in Baghdad. There was a college there. They call it girls' college. And one of the professors, her name is Dr. Kemp, she was there to teach English to the girls. Was she American? American. She had a contract for two years to come to Iraq, Baghdad, to uh, teach the girls in college English language. We were very friendly with her. She used to come and visit us for Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's. Before she left, my sister Koharik, she asked her, she said, how can I get to United States? And Dr. Kamp told her, I'm gonna send you special application and you will be in United States as a student, West Virginia College. She was professor there. So, 1961, my sister left Baghdad to the United States. During that time or year after, my brother graduated high school with honor. Which brother? Sero, the older brother. He graduated high school, so he wanted to be engineer. So he went to London, to England, Manchester, not London. Manchester to study to become an engineer. So that's what he did. Okay, let me tell you a few stories about my dad. Remember, he lost all his family and they didn't have any food during that uh, walk to the desert. Very few piece of bread or anything that they could survive. The only thing I, I hear, heard from him all the time, you should help others. If you have food, you have to share, and you don't waste food. That was his uh, logo, his uh, everything. When he was in uh, Mosul, he was helping a lot of students. I didn't know, we knew lately that every uh, kid that he had in that school, like I, when I was in sixth grade or fourth grade or fifth grade, he used to help other families that they couldn't afford the fee for the school. Like if I was in third grade, he will help somebody at third grade. 
If my brother was in fourth grade, he should help somebody in the fourth grade. That's how he was very generous. He was helping everybody anytime, anywhere that he could. So, during the World War II, there was another uh, sad story in Iraq. They used to uh, uh, deport Jews that they had to leave. They cannot stay in Iraq. So it's the same story as my dad did, all his family. He, was, he realized that these people are the same as we. They have to leave everything. They have to leave. He helped them. He advised them to leave everything to him. And wherever they reach, wherever in Europe or United States or wherever they're going to end up, he will sell everything and send them the money. I know I heard about these stories a lot, but he didn't tell us anything. Because he didn't want to, when he does something good, he doesn't want to talk about it. So he helped a lot of families and he helped them keep their house, keep their items and whatever they could, he sent the money after he took care of everything. This is one story. There was another story. We used to, summertime, we used to go to north. There is beautiful vacation places. Northern Iraq. Northern Iraq. And that's all happening in Mosul. Now, uh, the, the place was Shaklava. That's what they call the place, Shaklava. So uh, my dad was very uh, adventurer and he used to take us to places and we went to this north of Iraq, Mosul. Uh, it's a camping and picnic, all kind of thing. We had to stay there a month. And uh, my dad and the whole family and, of course, my grandmas and my Horkur, Amol and his family, everybody will be there. So we were all together in that summer. In Baklava? In uh, Shaklava. And I remember uh, now what my mom and they cooked and we had a good time. I used to climb the trees. I don't know why. Every time when I see a tree, I have to climb that tree. So that was my like adventure. That. <laughs> <laughs> so over there, at that area, north of Iraq, there are a lot of Kurds. They live there. Till now they live there. So there was a big war between Kurds and Arabs that time. I didn't know anything, but I heard later that there was a big, big, big fight between um, Arab leaders and the uh, uh, Turkish leaders. Or they were Kurdish. kind of Kurdish leaders. They were kind of uh, killing each other. And we don't know. My dad, again, during his transportation, during his traveling from one place in it, he saved one of the big uh, leaders of Kurds. So. Every time when we visit North, this person, he used to call my dad his brother. I don't know names. The only thing I know that we used to go to their palace and they used to take care of us. The big, big uh, places and they had a lot of different fruits, different foods. They used to say thank you to my dad because he saved him. One day, I was only maybe four or five years old. Oh, the tradition over there, if you want to marry, you love somebody, you have to, your son will marry one of the girls over there. So, uh, the leader of this uh, family, he was telling my dad to buy me and to, I have to stay with them to learn their culture, when I grew up, I will marry one of the sons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they like me, I don't know why. <laughs> so, uh, of course, my dad, and they were paying me million dollars. By then, million dollars was a lot. They promised my dad to pay million dollars if I stay with them. So, of course, my dad is never gonna leave anybody. <laughs> She's not gonna leave me there. So every time when I was not good or naughty or doing something that I'm not supposed to, my dad used to scare me. I'm going to sell you to these Kurds. <laughs> in, in Armenian. In Armenian. <laughs> I said, I knew I was scared. And then after that, he said, 
No, if they pay me millions of dollars, I don't and give this beautiful girl to anybody. So that's why I was uh, Baba Daddy's girl. Uh, so I'm so proud of him. When I moved here in LA and I had my kids, they used to come for a visit, and especially Birch. Oh my God, he's the boy and this and that. And we had a big baptism and he was so proud and he stayed with us for a, for a while. Let's continue. And I have to tell you about my life now. How we ended up in Canada. By then, in 1959, no, 1958, we left Iraq. Because my brother, Cero, he graduated and he went to Canada and he, was, he had a good job. So he asked the uh, Canadian government that he wants to bring his family to Canada. So they gave him permission and he got visas for us. So, November 1958, we left Iraq, we went to Beirut because that time Iraq did not have American embassy or Canadian embassy. We had to leave and go to Beirut and they start the process seeing how, to, uh, how we're going to go and leave Beirut to Canada. They had embassy there, we had to go and uh, dress up beautifully as we do all the time. We went to the Canadian embassy and they talked to us. They want to see us and they told us, okay, in a few, in a few weeks, we're going to get our visa and we're going to go to Canada. Was it uh, the whole family or was it just the women? By now, it was only eight of us. Like mom and dad, me and Anahid, Areknaz and Rafi. Zivart and Barwir, a year before us, they left because they got their visas before us. So they left to Canada. They were in Toronto, Canada already. So we stayed in Beirut almost a month. By Christmas, December 1958, we were already no, no, 1968. We are already ready to go to Canada, 1968. So the only boat that we, we want to travel by boat, not the plane, because we want to travel because we had no job and nothing. So we're coming from coast to coast. My dad said, let's go, let's go by boat. And we enjoy the cities that we stop and see what happens. And because he got a lot of stuff from home, he used to bring it with him, so we did. So we had a very nice friend in uh, Beirut, like uh, Uncle Hachig. He was one of the survivors of the genocide too, so my father knew him. So we stayed, uh, we had a good time with them. By January, no, let me tell you what we had. We left Beirut in January, beginning of January. January 68? 69. 69. Now it's 69. Okay. January 69. So we had to go to uh, use a Turkish boat because that was the only small boat left available. We're available that we can take from Beirut to Napoli, Italy. Okay, so your first stop was to Italy. To Italy. So my dad refused to do, sit in a Turkish boat because he said, I don't want to be spend money on the Turkish boat, but we, we begged him to go because we want to go to Canada. We don't want to, we don't want to stay in Beirut. So we asked Uncle Hachik, please, Uncle Hachik, tell my dad to, to say, okay, that we can sit in the boat. They're going to serve us and take care of us. So no problem. So my dad, uh, he accepted. So we were in the <laughs> Turkish boat. <laughs> to Napoli, Italy. 
So during that time, <laughs> they used to serve us and uh, take care of us, the morning tea and this kind of thing, and the, with the Turkish music in the morning. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you love that. <laughs> I'm sure he loved that. that. And then after he was, he spoke uh, Turkish. When the people uh, noticed that this guy is speaking Turkish, they give us more service, more food, and all that, and we had a good time. <laughs> but we ended up in Napoli. This all is happening in January. I don't know exact dates. So we stayed a week in Napoli. I had a good time in Italy. I loved it. I wish I could go back again, but I loved it. It was beautiful. So. Now we have to take Cristoforo Colomba. It's a big, big boat for the ocean. This is the last trip until April because the ocean is dangerous and we have a hard time to find travel. You know, they didn't have services. So we ended up in Cristoforo Colomba boat. Beautiful boat. The service and all kind of food and entertainments. So we ended up in Halifax, Canada, January 24th, 1969. 69. 69. We ended up in, uh, in Canada. Is that when you left or when you arrived? We arrived Canada, Halifax, north of uh, Canada. So we have to take a train now, to take a train to Toronto. So, another 24 hours in the train, we ended up in Canada, January 24th, 1969. That was the happiest day of my life. I saw snow the first time, because I never seen snow. Now, I had to, we all, uh, my brother and my sister and Baruish, they already rented us an apartment that we all going to be there for a while until we find a bigger house because now we are 10 of us. This is in Toronto. In Toronto, Canada. No, yes. I had to go to school in Toronto. This is special classes for new immigrants that they come to Canada. They teach English because... Uh, oh, I forgot to tell you, before I left Iraq, I knew we were going to go to Canada. I had to learn English. We knew the alphabet. We knew a little bit, a few words because of the movies and all that, but we couldn't speak English very well. So I had to take some courses in... Um, there was a small school uh, from the American Embassy, I think. They're teaching us English uh, language. So I took courses there. When I came to Canada, I thought I didn't understand English. I thought I didn't know any English. But when I went to the school, I realized I was the top student. <laughs> I knew everything that they're going to tell us. I used to help the teacher. And all the immigrants that they came to Canada school with me, they were from uh, Russian countries, Yugoslavia or Czechoslovakia. These two places, that time, they opened the door to the people to leave. So that's why they ended up in Canada and they had no English classes. They didn't know English at all. And some from Spain and some from Italy, the immigrants that I used to go to school with. It was fun. I learned how to, I went to school for English. I went to school to learn how to type. We had a typewriter at home and I used to practice. So I was ready to learn typing too. And at the same time I used to um, go to computer classes. Then they needed data entry and all computer stuff. Uh, during that time, same day, I had three schools to go to from one place to another. In a few months, six months I think, Suddenly the, the principal called, I said, I find a job for you, you should go. And I was kind of worried, oh, I'm not ready to work on this and that. No, I said, you're ready to go. And I start working um, data entry department at Simpsons. There is a like Eaton's and Simpsons big store. Uh, eighth floor was my first job. And I was so happy that I can work and I can go. Uh, any places I want to, like theater and musical without any 
chaperone or I'm not scared, I'm free. And that was a very happy time. How old were you? I was 23. So, 23, 24, something like that. So, um, I got married on 1972 with Vahe. I knew him from back home. We used to act and active in the in the club. In Mosul or Baghdad? Baghdad. No Mosul anymore. Baghdad. Everything is Baghdad now. So he promised. He said, "I'm gonna come after you and I marry you." So I didn't believe it. I said, "Oh yeah, he's he's okay." <laughs> so, but he kept his promise. By that time, 1971. Yeah, there was a group of Americans, Armenian Americans try to help Armenians in Iraq to immigrate to the United States. They call them, their name is ANCHA, A-N-C-H-A, abbreviation. So most of the people that I knew in the club, athletic club or the youth club, everybody's here now because of that ANCHA group they helped all the Armenians to leave Baghdad. Were they based and, in Los Angeles? Yes, all of them, most of them. 90% they are here in Los Angeles. Some they went to New York and Boston, very few. But most of them, you know, you go to the place that your friends are that teach you and help you to uh, establish your life or start work or do something. So 1972, uh, Vahe came to Boston because he couldn't have his green card yet, legal papers to come to Canada. So we got married in Boston, in Watertown, one of the churches. That's the Armenian community over there. All the orphans and the survivors of the genocide, they end up in Watertown. So 1972, October 7th, I got married and came to Los Angeles, city of angels. And I loved every minute of it. What part of Los Angeles did you move to? First, we were in Glendale. Patil was born in Glendale. Of course, after a month or so, when I came here in 1972, I started working in 1973, January 1st. I started working in a bank in downtown Western Savings and Loans. I started working there. I was very happy. We had a good time and all that. And then I had Patil, and she was born in 1977. After a few years, Berge was born, 1983, October 24th. And I was very happy mom to have my babies. And we had a big house. Uh, we by now we lived in Temple City. I had a house. But when I knew that I'm going to have Berge, I needed a bigger house, so we bought a house in Arcadia, and Berge was born in Arcadia. Was Kano in Arcadia too? My sister was in Arcadia too. The only sister I have from uh, us uh, the living in the United States was my sister. The rest of the family, they still live in Toronto. Uh, everybody's married, they had good kids, and some, some they didn't get married, so now every, they're coming for a my son's wedding, and I cannot wait to see them again. <laughs> and we're going to have a very nice wedding. And then, that's my life. And I am now retired, and I live very happily in Agura Hills. And I have my house. And this is it. <laughs>